Hey, good morning. Um, this is the last uh, cyber defense talk of the spring term. Um, today, it's our pleasure to have PhD student Anis Goloshevsky present part of his dissertation work on automatic cryptographic binding of context to messages in network protocols. Um, it's uh, very interesting and significant work that um, is one of the three major chapters of his dissertation. This summer, we'll be continuing this work, and I understand um, Ennis will also be conducting uh, additional workshops. Um, so if anybody wants to learn how to perform protocol analysis, you're welcome to join those workshops this summer. Uh, we will resume these CDL talks um, in the fall semester. We're ready to go. <clears throat> so I'm going to share some slides. So please let me know if these appear when I do. Okay. Do we have slides? Yes, no. Okay, I'm going to assume yes. we're fine. We can see them. All right, excellent. Okay, so, hi, I'm Anis Uh Thanks for introducing me, Alan. I'm still a PhD student, but I'm graduating this May. I defended my PhD in April. One of my chapters was on automatically binding cryptographic context to messages in network protocols using formal methods. This is ongoing work, so we've done some stuff since April, and I'm here today to sort of give an update on what that is and to introduce the subject for those of you who have never seen this before. So when, when I talk about network protocols, I'm referring to essentially computer systems, although you can think of these entities as anything that, that communicate. But here we're talking about computer systems that are gonna send messages over a computer network. Now we're looking at a specific type of network. We're looking at a Dolovyao network, which is a very specific adversarial model in which the adversary controls the network and the messages that flow through it. So it's a very powerful adversarial model. And the idea is that we're going to be looking at protocols where an initiator is going to send some initial message into this network. The initial message will get routed by the network, who is, you know, curious, but doesn't want to actually, it's, it's a malicious network, but it's going to allow protocols to happen. The idea is to subvert the security properties of the protocols, not to deny communication. And the responder will receive this initial message from the network, maybe, and then will respond with a message in turn, which will go through the network and perhaps arrive at the initiator, depending on the details of the protocol, right? So the reason this is a difficult problem is because it's unclear to us what the view of each of these protocol communicants is. So the initiator has a certain view of this protocol. They're sending messages into the network and receiving messages out. And the responder has a corresponding view where they're receiving messages and then sending some response into the network. This question arises over and over again. Are they actually in, are they communicating with each other? So is this the same protocol that's happening on both ends of this communication? Or is the Dolophia network manipulating these messages in such a way that these views are actually quite different? And if such a thing were to happen, we would call this a protocol interaction. So what a protocol interaction is, is when you have two instances of a protocol. So here we have protocol P on the left. On the right, we have protocol Q. And the idea is that information from the session here between the initiator and some entity in the network, perhaps the network itself, ends up worming its way into the session here between the network and the responder. Likewise, this can happen in both directions. So protocol interaction by the way, if you're looking at this, you might see that this resembles somewhat a man in the middle attack diagram, and that's a very connected idea. So typically, a logical flaw that allows for protocol interaction generally manifests, if the flaw is bad enough, as a man in the middle attack on that protocol. And I'll give a concrete example of that in a little bit here. So I'm going to roll through a, a few different subjects here. And these are all brief, so don't worry that the list is long. I'm gonna, I'll introduce you to a motivating example for this problem. We'll look at a protocol transformation that will take flawed protocols and correct them. We'll look at the goals and properties of this transformation. Then I'll introduce you to how to do automatic binding with a tool called the Cryptographic Protocol Shapes Analyzer, or CPSA. We'll look at examples of performing such transformations on, on a real protocol. We'll compare it to other approaches in the literature, and then I'll share some of our long-term goals for this project. 
So I'd like to introduce you to protocol PI. So protocol PI is an arbitrary protocol with some properties. So protocol PI is gonna be a stand in here for other protocols. It has this generic structure, but the generic structure is specific. So protocol PI features two communicants, an initiator and a responder. The initiator will begin this protocol always by sending some message, let's call it M1 to the responder. In turn, the responder will reply to each message from the initiator with some response, which could be MI at some I step of the protocol or MN for the final message. What are the constraints on PI? Well, it's gonna be exactly two roles, initiator and responder, and it's going to be N steps. So we have some fixed number of steps N, and the third constraint is that the roles are going to take turns. So the initiator sends a message, message responder response, initiator response, responder response, and so on until we've completed all end steps. It's not actually important whether the initiator or responder send the final message, and this can vary based on the protocol pi, the actual protocol, not the generic stand in here. The question sort of linking this idea with the idea I just shared is does pi resist, does some arbitrary protocol pi resist protocol interactions? Of, of the sort that I uh, that I already talked about. In many cases, the answer to this question is no. So I will give an example where we let pi be the Needham Schroeder public key protocol. And I'll show you that this protocol does not resist the sort of protocol interaction I was talking about. And then a question arises, can we improve pi and can we improve it automatically? And the answer is yes, with cryptographic binding techniques. And we'll talk about what that is as well in the near future. So let's consider this case where pi is equivalent to the Needham Schroeder public key protocol. This is, by the way, the protocol that we always drag out, you know, whenever we want to show show anybody flawed protocol design. It's a very classic example that's been honestly done to death. So I'm guilty of doing that here as well. You can simplify the Needham Schroeder public key protocol into an exchange of three messages. You'll note that this form resembles what we just talked about with protocol pi. And Let's go over the criterion, right? So we have an initiator and a responder. They take turns sending messages and there are a fixed number of steps, in this case, three. So this is a valid choice for Pi. How does this protocol work? The, the goal of this protocol, by the way, is to authenticate the initiator and the responder to each other mutually, so mutual authentication. The initiator begins this protocol by generating what's called a random nonce. Cryptographic nonces are really important in protocols. They basically allow a session to have some uniqueness. If you don't include these, Protocols become very vulnerable to replay attacks and all kinds of other problems. So nonces provide freshness. A nonce is just a random number, by the way, but it's generated in a cryptographically secure manner. So the initiator sends this nonce together with their identity under the pub, encrypted under the public key of the responder. So this is asymmetric crypto. If we encrypt this, this uh, message here with the public key of the responder, only the responder who possesses the private key, that's an assumption we make generously, can de de decipher this message. So the initiator sends this message to the responder. Responder deciphers it, extracts the initiator's nonce from it. Because the initiator's identity is in the message, the responder knows who to send the response back to. So it's gonna take the initiator's nonce, add a nonce of its own to a message, and then encrypt all this under the public key of the initiator, who it knows it's, who it thinks it's speaking to rather because the initiator's name was in the first message. So this is kind of a challenge response thing. The challenge is, hey, I'm gonna send you this random string. Can you decipher this and send it back to me with your knowledge of the private key that you ought to have if you're who you claim you are? That's sort of where the idea of authentication is coming from. The initiator is going to answer this challenge by extracting from the second message the responder's nonce using the initiator's knowledge of the private key, encrypts this with the responder's public key and sends it back. So the end result is the initiator and a responder at the end of this protocol should be certain that they're speaking with each other. This is important because I remind you that the, the medium they're communicating over is the stolen fiat network, which can manipulate and mess with messages, but it cannot break crypto primitives without knowledge of the secret keys. So this protocol contains a classic cryptographic binding flaw. The flaw succinctly put is that the responder's nonce does not bind to the responder's identity. So cleverness in this protocol is that the initiator includes its name with its nonce. So this actually binds the initiator's nonce to the initiator's identity. This is really important. The responder unfortunately does not do this. In the responder's response, there's a there are two nonces in it, right? The initiator's nonce and the responder's nonce, but the responder does not include their name. 
So because of this, the responder's nonce does not bind to the responder's identity. If you have a malicious entity in the middle, so the initiator is gonna speak intentionally, by the way, which is allowed in Dolifiao, to this malicious entity. The malicious entity can forward the initiator's message, decipher it, re-encrypt it, and forward it to a, some responder somewhere else in the network. That responder then responds, believing they're speaking with the initiator. The malicious network communicant sends this message to the initiator. The initiator is expecting this message, deciphers it, and sends the resulting responder nonce back to the malicious adversary. Malicious adversary now sends it back to the responder. The end result is that the initiator authenticates itself to the malicious communicant and also authenticates the malicious communicant. But the malicious communicant authenticates itself as the initiator to some legitimate responder. So that's not good. And this results from a failure, by the way, to agree on session parameters. In particular, in the example I just gave, the initiator and the responder do not agree on the session parameters. Let's take a look at the session parameters each of them were operating on. So the initiator is assuming I'm the initiator. I'm speaking with this malicious communicant. The identity is just mouth, but it could be anything on the internet. And these are the two nonces we're using in this, in this session. The responder, on the other hand, is having a, having a session of its own with the malicious communicant, the network. It believes that the malicious communicant is a legitimate initiator. It believes itself to be the legitimate responder, but it's using the same nonces as the session between the initiator and the, and, the, and the network. So this is bad. This mismatch creates a discrepancy, and this discrepancy suggests the existence. In fact, it directly results from a man-in-the-middle attack by the malicious communicant, which is, by the way, the network, the Dolovyad network, and that's allowed in the DY model. So we want to stop attacks like this on arbitrary protocols pi, by the way. So Lowe, who discovered this attack in 1995, made a simple correction to this protocol. The simple correction is to bind the network, the, the responder's nonce to the responder's identity by including the responder's identity in the response from the responder. That's a lot of instances of response. This simple correction solves the problem, by the way. You don't have this man in the middle attack anymore that I just described if you include, if you include this identifier. So let's talk about how we can transform an arbitrary protocol pi, including the example I just gave of Needham Schroeder, to resist this sort of attack. So we're going to define some transformation of pi to a protocol we're going to call pi t. So it's a transform protocol pi t. And we're going to make a few assumptions here. Pi t will have some honest roles specified, the initiator role and a responder role corresponding to sort of what we've already looked at. And then we're going to say that S is some fresh session of Pi T, so not a duplicate of some other session, but a session with unique nonces. And then succinctly, the goal for this transformation is that when we execute Pi T, an initiator and a responder will reach what we call injective agreement, so a one-to-one -one agreement correspondence. So only the two of them will agree on the session parameters of S. And we also call this session context agreement in this work. So we want, at the end of the protocol, both of both of the communicants to agree on all the session parameters, which was not the case, by the way, in the, uh, in the attack example. And we want this to always be true. So how do we construct IT? There's a sort of three-step process we're going to follow here. We're going to first identify what the session parameters are, including the intro steps. So that's the first step in which a parameter appears for the protocol PI. Then we're going to construct a corresponding context exchange protocol, Pi Context. So this is a whole new protocol that's going to sort of mirror Pi, and I'll show you how that looks. And then we're going to compose Pi and this context exchange protocol, Pi Context, together to construct Pi T. And by compose, we're going to interleave the messages. We're going to combine the two protocols. So how do we define context, by the way? So we give a recursive definition of context, and I'll sort of go over what this definition looks like. So the base context, CTX0, is the very first context object we create for a protocol pi. This context, this base context comprises a hash of the name of pi. So what is the name of the protocol? The specific version of pi, because you can have sometimes, you know, messages interoperating between different versions of a protocol, which can lead to bad results, by the way. And then we're going to also include an identifier for the initiator and an identifier for the responder. So that's the 
space context node. From then on out, we're going to define the ith context, so the context corresponding to step i of pi, as a hash of an encryption of the previous context, so I, the i minus 1 context, a random nonce we generate for step i. This resembles the random nonce as you saw in Needham Schroeder just now. An identifier for the message i. So this could be like the control point. So what message number is it in a sequence of messages? Or like what's the specific tag or code for the message? And then a set of parameters that the message introduces to the protocol. And I remind you of this idea of introducing a parameter simply refers to the fact that this is the first message in which the parameter appears. So if there's a new parameter that appears in the message, we're going to include that in the hash. And then this, the encryption of the context, by the way, is simply an encryption of the, oh, sorry, it's an encryption of the context under some secret DK. You have several different choices for E, by the way, here. In the work we do here, we actually do, we do asymmetric crypto. So we sign the context nodes. So we'd be encrypting these with private keys. But there are other options. You can, for example, use a symmetric key or like an HMAC construction or any number of other choices. And by the way, just to clarify the notation here, MI is the message at the I step of pi. RI is going to be a new fresh nonce that we generate for step I in the context exchange protocol. And K is some encryption key. It could be a public key, symmetric key, what have you. So let me show you the structure of this pi context, this context exchange protocol. So in, in many ways, it resembles the structure of pi, right? So you have the initiator and the responder, and the initiator is going to send an initial message, and then they're going to ping pong back and forth until the responder will send the final message or the initiator, much like in the previous case, the final message is up to the, the step, basically, or is, is it an even or odd number of steps that will dictate who sends the final message. Now, this final context has the property that it doesn't add anything, so it's not creating a new context block. Rather, it's just a re-encryption of the previous context block at step n. But we do add an additional step to pi by doing this. And note that at each step of this context exchange protocol, what we're sending is this encrypted context, which is a successive hash of previous contexts. In this case, the initial context, context 0 and context 1. And then we have these random nonces that provide freshness for each of these contexts. So let's talk about protocol pi t. So to create pi t, we take the original protocol uh, uh, pi, and then we append to each of its messages, the messages of pi context. And by the way, we'll include this final step as well. So the final step of pi context appears here too. So that means that the initiator, instead of just sending the original message m1, now sends m1 sigma 1, which is this encrypted context, and r1, which is the corresponding uh, fresh nonce for the context sigma 1. So the security goals of pi t. We're going to talk about strands here. Strands are just instances of roles. So like if you and I are actually engaging in a protocol, we would be strands. And strands usually play the role of some role in the protocol. It could be legitimate roles or what we call penetrator roles, which simulate, which approximate abilities of the network, right? So we're going to say that Z and Z prime are strands in the pi T strand space, which means strands that are within, within the realm of that protocol's existence. These are going to be legitimate strands, actually, as we'll see down here. For each step I of pi T, the following security goal holds. So this is a, def, a goal we want to have true for every step of pi T. For all parameters of pi t at step i, so however many session parameters we've seen at step i that have been introduced, right? Talking about this idea of introduced variables. Some strand, so a receiver strand that has a height of i, so that means the strand has executed i steps of pi t, that believes the value of a parameter to be p, implies the existence of some other strand, z prime, that's a sender strand with the same height as z, so also having executed i steps of pi t, that also agrees on that parameter. So we're defining an objective agreement security goal here. So we want to say that if we have one strand that is at a certain step of pi t and agrees and thinks that these are the values of the parameters, then there must be another strand at that same height that also believes those parameters. We want this to be true for every step i. Let's talk about some of the properties of pi t. Pi t preserves the functionality of pi. This is actually quite important, but we note that we send the same messages that we did before. So when we perform this transformation on pi, 
We're not breaking pi. We're not eliminating whatever it was originally doing. With a caveat, which is that we have access, both parties have access to this encryption function E and the corresponding key needed to encrypt and decrypt the context. PyT will provide session context agreement or this injective agreement on session parameters between the, an initiator and a responder. PyT preserves secrecy properties of Py, but does not provide any. This is a claim for, that we have yet to prove, but we believe that it's true and a near-term objective for this project is to prove this claim. There's no reason to believe that we leak secrecy properties of Pi because we're only in, we're incorporating parameters in the hash functions, cryptographic hashes. So there isn't information for an adversary to extract parameters that it wouldn't already know from just observing an instance of Pi. We note that the choice of the encryption function E is important. Under some circumstances, if Pi has anonymity properties, you will expose, well, you will com compromise those properties if you choose E, for example, to be public key crypto, because now you're you know, throwing in public keys, whereas before maybe you were not. So, so, so we, don't, we don't have any guarantees for security goals like anonymity or consensus, for example, given that we're also only looking at two, two row protocols. So an astute observer might at this point point out that this process is not free. So we seem to be adding a fair number of things to the original protocol pi. So in addition to the operations that Pi was already doing, communicants now have to hash two n plus one contexts, right? So each communicant has to hash a context to create it. And then you also have to hash the context to verify it. So at every step I of Pi T, there are two hashes happening. And you have this additional hash when you create the original context, context zero, right? We have to generate n random nonces because we have a random nonce for each step of Pi T. And then we have to encrypt and decrypt. This is the most expensive part of this. Two n plus two contexts. So at each step of the protocol now, we have to encrypt the, the context to create sigma i, right? At the i step. To verify sigma i, we have to decrypt it. And then at the end, we also have this final step where we have to encrypt uh, sigma n and then decrypt sigma n to verify. That's the final context. We're also adding communication overhead. We're adding to each message two b bytes where B is the length of a cryptographic hash. And we're assuming that the nonce that we're generating is the same length as the hash. You might even use the hash function in, as part of a cryptographic random number generator to generate these nonces. It's up to you, but we're just assuming that they're the same length. And we have to send one additional message, of course, because we have this final context that has to transmit between the communicants for the last step of pi t. So the purpose of doing all this is we want to automatically apply this, this transformation to protocols, specifically the protocols specified in the CPSA language. So the cryptographic protocol shapes analyzer is a formal verification tool for verifying the confidentiality and secrecy properties of network protocols. It uses strand spaces. So there's a nice matchup between sort of the model we're working in here and what the tool does. And the goal is to have a user specify a protocol in CPSA's language, which is a formal specification of the protocol. Then we pass it to our automatic binding tool, which will compute a context for it, then transform the protocol, you know, creating this context exchange protocol, pi context, and merging the two together. And it's also going to automatically generate the security goals we just talked about for each step I of the protocol. In fact, it already does this. And then we hand this entire package to the cryptographic protocol shapes analyzer, which will then evaluate all those security goals we generated. So at the end, we have a nice proof of those security goals. So the, the session context agreement, we will know if this is the case for an input protocol pi, assuming that pi fits that set of criterion that we gave, the criteria that we gave. So how do we infer context? This process is actually quite simple. So looking at the Needham Schroeder example from before, message variables are introduced the first time we see them in a message. So when Alice sends this initial message to Bob, for example, we see that Alice introduces a nonce to the session. Alice introduces her identity to the session. Alice also introduces Bob's identity to the session because Alice is using the public key for Bob. So we just include these as the introduced variables for this first message. Then the only other variable that gets introduced in this relatively simple protocol is Bob's nonce. So Bob, when Bob responds, introduces Bob's nonce, right? And the sum of these four variables constitutes the session, uh, like, like the session parameters here. You would also include other things like the name of the message. Like here, we've given names to each of these messages, NS init, NS respond, NS final, 
And likewise, you would also mention that, hey, this is the Needham Schroeder protocol and this is the version of it. So those are things that would go into that initial context. Let's talk about how to transform messages in CPSA. So in CPSA, you express messages between communicants as, as expressions that are like similar to scheme, but it's not scheme is the important thing to note. This is not executable source code. But for instance, if you wanted to send a message, you would create a send event, and then you would include in it this bolded message. This is the original message that you see up here. So the first message Alice sends, this is how you would express it in CPSA. It's an encryption of N1, that's Alice's nonce, A, that's going to be Alice's identity, and the pub key of B, which is the public key of Bob. That's the original message. Now we're going to add a bunch of stuff to this when we're doing an automatic transformation. We're going to use macros to do several things here. Let's look at the innermost green colored statement here, init context. This is where we initialize that context zero. So we're going to say that it's the NS public key protocol. It's a flawed version because this is indeed, we're working with the flawed version, not the corrected version. And the protocol principles, the communicants that are talking are A and B. So all that goes in the initial context. And then we sign this initial context with the private key of A. Why do we do it? With A, well, A is the initiator, and the initiator always generates this initial context zero. Now, to actually send the first message, we're going to append this context with the information from this first message that's bolded up here. So we're going to generate a fresh nonce R1. We're going to say this is the first message of Needham Schroeder, NS-1. And then we include a concatenation of M1 and A. This is this uh, purple message in the append context which is an S expression. It can be a little bit hard to read, but I encourage you to look at the tab levels to kind of see what's what's together here. And that creates context one, and then we can sign it with A's, key, A's private key again to create sigma one. Sigma one is the first signed context that we're gonna transmit on the network. And we transmit that together with R1. So the first message then, instead of just being this encryption of M1A under the public key of B, becomes the original message plus Sigma one plus R one, exactly as we illustrated in the, in the previous protocol diagram for the, for uh, IT. And we can do this to each message. It's, it's a straightforward automatic method. So let's take a look at an example of a protocol that we've transformed this way. So we wanted to correct the Needham Schroeder protocol, but we wanted to do it without knowing how to correct it. So one powerful result of this transformation is you don't actually need to understand the flaw in the original protocol to correct it. So what we do here is, if you look at the messages transmitting between the initiator and the responder, you can see the original messages of Needham Schroeder, because those messages are untouched. They're exactly the same as they were before. However, we're adding to each message the sigma, the sigma i r i, and then we have the sigma final at the end, so an extra message. And as I've sort of alluded to, the context zero, which creates sigma zero, is a hash of NS, the flawed version, init and respond, the identities. And then we encrypt that under the initiator's private key to essentially sign it. And then we create context one by hashing together sigma zero with a new fresh nonce R1. This is NS dash one, the first message of the Needham Schroeder protocol. And then we include the introduced variables, which are n init, n init. We could include a responder here, but the responder identity is already established in the initial context, so it would be redundant to do so, but you could do so. You just have to be consistent on both ends. And we create sigma one by performing the signature again. There's some, because of the recursive process, there's some redundancy in signing twice here, and probably this is unnecessary. So something we're looking at is getting rid of this redundant step. What we then transmit as the first message is the original message, sigma one and R1. We perform this step, by the way, again at the responder, and then again at the initiator to create sigma two and sigma three, which we transmit with R2 and R3 respectively in their messages of the original protocol pi. Then we have this final step where we re-encrypt sigma three with the respondent's private key to create sigma final, send that to the initiator. So this transformation provably eliminates the flaw that we saw in Needham Schroeder earlier. I do wanna discuss the transformation a little bit with you though. So in contrast with the original Needham Schroeder protocol, Needham Schroeder T, the transform protocol, achieves the security goals that we set out to achieve. Generating Needham Schroeder T does not require identifying Rho's attack. You don't need to understand the binding flaw in the original protocol to apply this transformation and to get results from it. However, NST is a much more heavy-handed fix than Needham Schroeder Low, which is the correction I showed earlier.
So instead of just adding a single identifier to a message, you're adding this entire second protocol to the first protocol with you know, some number of encryptions, decryptions, hashes, and so on that I went over earlier. So this is a more heavy handed technique. So it, when possible, you could, should probably try to correct the protocol by just identifying flaws in it and correcting them. But that process is actually quite challenging. It took uh, indeed quite a, few, quite a number of years, over a decade for the flaw in Needham Schroeder to even get discovered and correct in the first place, mainly because our understanding of what network protocol security looks like changed during that time. That said, this is a powerful result for arbitrary protocols pi, especially if the protocol is complicated, manual analysis and correction might be might require quite a bit of experience and knowledge. Whereas pushing a button and having an automatic transformation apply and, and achieve these security goals is quite tempting in these situations. So I wanted to talk about some alternate approaches to doing this type of work. So a common approach that comes actually from universal composability, which is this idea that like your protocol can be composed arbitrarily with any number of other protocols in the infinite world. So in the par par parallel composability, essentially. So one idea from UC or universal composability is uh, this idea of a session tag. So you can keep two sessions separate and prevent them from bleeding into each other by creating what's called a session tag. We're gonna define a session tag Lambda here, which is a concatenation of identities. So R1 through RK are the identities of K participants of some session. And then each of them are gonna contribute a nonce, N1 through NK. And the idea is that you broadcast all these nonces before starting the protocol. And everyone has the nonces. They already know the identities of each other. So they just create the session tag Lambda, right? So we compute Lambda by broadcasting each nonce end to all communicants. And then the idea from there is we're gonna bind each message to Lambda. For example, here's an example. So for a message I, that, that emits from the, well, I, I've i overloaded I here. So let's say for a message S. So S is some, some sequence number in this protocol. The role I is gonna to transmit to the role J. Message S concatenated with a signature of message S together with the sequence number S and Lambda. So we're basically binding message S to Lambda. We're signing that combination of values. Then we're concatenating that signature together with the original message S, and then we encrypt all of that with the public key of the recipient J. So this is a real method. It's actually from the paper synthesizing secure protocols. There are other approaches that are similar. So we see this idea of session tags, for example, in works by Eric Hennis, uh, from one session of many dynamic tags for security protocols. So it's from 2008, 2007. So it's been a while actually, since there's been a lot of active work on this specific subject. Uh, zooming forward slightly to 2013, uh, Carbone and Gutman looked at session and separability and security protocols. And they were looking at creating these combinations of nonces, which are pretty similar to session tags, like the idea is similar. So you see this idea of session tags appears over and over again. It is not absent in our work. We indirectly create such a session tag by introducing random nonces at each step of the context exchange protocol. What we do has some advantages though. For example, session context, the way we define it, is composable and captures a lot more information. So not only do we create what is essentially a session tag, but we create a fingerprint of the entire session. Sigma final is essentially a data object that contains a record of the session that happened. All the session parameters, the protocol, the protocol's version, the communicants. And you can include this fingerprint, this data object, in other protocols. So if you're composing two protocols together, and they depend on the outcome of the first protocol. Let's call it like pi, pi one, and then we have pi two. If pi two needs the result of pi one, it can refer to the context from pi one. So this is like the final session context. You could, for example, include it in messages of pi two. And it also requires fewer additional messages because we're not broadcasting the nonces in, an, in a separate ad hoc protocol prior to beginning our protocol. So we're just incorporating the, these, this process into the message flow that already exists. There are limits to our work. We're only looking at two party protocols of a specific form. So the, the constraints on pi apply, right? It has to be two roles, has to have this ping pong of messages, uh, has to have fixed steps n. We haven't gone and proved the transferability of security properties. This is something we're looking to do over the summer. So for example, if pi has certain confidentiality properties, we haven't shown conclusively that pi t also has those properties. We suspect it does, but Suspecting is not enough in this context. 
And we don't have a general proof of the security goal. So we can prove case by case for some transformation that the security goal holds, but we have yet to formulate a proof that states that for every possible, every valid transformation, these goals hold. This is a proof I'm actually working on right now and hope to have done it over the summer as well. So long-term goals for this project, as I just alluded to, we wanna prove general theorems for the authentication properties of pi t. Specifically, we wanna prove properties of pi when composed with pi context, right? We're composing these two protocols together by combining them and we wanna state that this composition has certain properties. We wanna identify and argue transferabilities of security properties of pi. So if pi already has some security properties, we're not assuming it has any, but if it already has some, we want to be able to state that pi t also has those properties and that our transformation didn't break those properties. We want to prove that as well. The grand vision for this is a full automation pipeline from a specification in CPSA to an executable implementation of the protocol. That's the grand vision here. And we also note that right now we can only apply this technique to two party protocols. We haven't generalized it to multiple parties and the challenges of doing so are unknown, but we assume it's hard. So with that in mind, uh, I'm open to taking questions. If you have any questions about this work. Hello. Um, so I, I noticed that uh, like you generalized like the operation of digital signature, like in the context uh, exchange protocol to like any form of encryption, like what's the motivation for that? So the motivation is several fold. One of the big motivations is rooted in practical reality. We're actually seeing that, you know, especially facing facing the threat of quantum computers, symmetric symmetric uh, keys are becoming an option in things like TLS, uh, which is strange, by the way. I actually think that the whole point of TLS, I think, is to arrive at some session key without already having, you know, a shared secret. But but we're seeing a rise of that. So supporting those kinds of mechanisms is important. So things like HMAX and just symmetric encryption in general. And it's also not necessary strictly to use digital signatures. So there's flexibility here and I want that flexibility to be evident. So this is the reason for the generalization of the encryption function E. I think as long as E has, has certain properties, there are many choices of E that will work here and the proofs will apply for all of them. There, it might also be easier to prove some of these results with symmetric instead of asymmetric encryption. So that, that is also a motivator. To answer your question? Uh, yes, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. A, a very minor question. In one of the early slides where you had a diagram of the transformation process, uh, can you pull that slide up? Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember which slide it was? No. So, do you mean the the diagram of the transform protocol or the diagram no. of the context exchange? It's like protocol? a block diagram with arrows, a different one. Oh, this one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. If you look at the lower left hand side, do you intend the arrows to be pointing in the way they they are? And if so, why? So there was. There was this idea of refinement at some point where you iteratively refine the protocol. That idea I don't think is present in the project anymore, but the block diagram still reflects that, that original conception. So I think the current design actually does all this in one step, but the original process was going to do it like per message. So iteratively for each step I. So you would be going through this, this process repeatedly for a step I of the protocol. That's still a way to implement it. Can you say a little more about the workshops you plan to do this summer? Yeah, so prior to COVID, we had a vibrant group of students working on protocol analysis here at UMBC. Many of them have graduated since. Several of them completed their master's doing projects using CPSA. Um, and we've been offering workshops to support things like the intro plus E students, uh, which is a special topics research course, which I think is being offered this fall, right? Correct. So it's open to all students. Um, we've trained graduate students, undergraduate students, high school students successfully. And over the summer, we're gonna start having weekly meetings and also in parallel, we'll be running these workshops to try and rebuild the, 
the sort of ranks of the lab so that we can do a lot more protocol research than we're doing right now. And this is an open invitation to all students because we're definitely actively recruiting for the first time in a few years, actually, to, to, this, to this extent. So in those workshops, you'll learn how to use CPSA to prove authentication and secrecy properties of protocols, uh, including case studies, including designing your own protocols to, to achieve certain goals. Um, it's light on math in the sense that we don't get into doing actual proofs in the workshops until the later steps. Um, if, and that's sort of optional for students that are interested in learning and in, in learning the more mathematic side of strand spaces. But it's it's quite it, it's there's a lot of pictures. It's 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 fairly approachable, and we've had good success teaching students. So I encourage anybody who is interested to attend. And more information about that will come out before the summer begins. Any other questions? Doesn't seem like it. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker. Yep, thank you very much. And uh, this is the last uh, CDL talk of the spring. We'll be back in the fall with when we resume our biweekly um, CDL talks. On Monday morning at 9 o'clock, uh, Cyrus Bonatti will be defending his dissertation. Okay, I'll see you all then. <laughs>